All right. Well, I'm Doug Hagedorn, and uh, welcome to the Pillars of Lead Leadership uh, podcast. I have Dr. Uh, Ron Riggio uh, with us today. And so, you know, we are privileged because when I did the research on uh, Dr. Ron, he's a Renaissance man of sorts. Um, I looked at your background, sir, social science, academic, intellectual, yet still a practitioner and relatable. So you've got a, a little bit of psychology, a little bit of education, a little philosophy, uh, social psychologist and nonverbal communication expert. How would you define yourself in one sentence? Yeah, I think I, I put on my LinkedIn uh, profile that I'm a, a dilettante extraordinaire, um, which was kind of a partly tongue in cheek because one of my uh former students is a stand-up comedian. She said, I need to have more humor in my profile. But I, but I think it's true. I mean, I, I'm interested in a lot of different things. And so I've jumped around a lot. But my, I mean, my real focus is on leadership, broadly defined, and we'll talk about that. And, and the other things kind of led up to that. Yeah, well, I, I too am the same. I get bored easily or I go in um, kind of these all in phases of, of these three to five year increments. And, uh, and, uh, so nothing wrong with that. I would never apologize, but your background is impressive. You've been at Claremont McKenna for uh, 27 plus years, professor of uh, leadership and organizational philosophy. And I wish I could have gone with you to be a visiting uh, leadership scholar at uh, Cambridge in the uh, UK yeah, yeah, that was that was a, a great experience. Yeah, yeah, and you've been up and down the coast there at Cal State University of California, and uh, you, you've won uh, outstanding teacher awards and professor of the year awards. And uh, your research is what uh, what led me to you when I was uh, completing my dissertation and uh, stumbled upon much of that. But you've done a lot of publications and textbooks and you're doing some leadership uh, consulting and training now and uh we'll, we'll talk about a couple of the ways people can get in touch with you but anything i missed there yeah no 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 that pretty much covers it yeah your psychology today blog um great stuff called cutting edge leadership and it talks about uh a variety of topics including uh, career leadership ethics and legacy and and I spent quite a bit of time with your new book, uh, Leadership Development, 365 Steps to Becoming a Better Leader. Now, I've tried this kind of one-year Bible thing, which I can never do. Um, and so maybe I can get through your 365 days because it's only like a, a page uh, yeah. per, per topic, right? Yeah. I mean, the idea of that book was basically, can we get little bite-sized lessons that, you know, you could put the bed the the book on your on your nightstand and you know wake up in the morning and read for 10 minutes or five minutes and and uh, at the bottom of each um uh daily lesson or each each page essentially is tips for leader development so what can you do during the day that would help you in that area of leadership and i one of the things i said is you, you know if you could do it a day at a time but they're sort of chunked into weeks mm -hmm. so to do it you know you could read the whole week or whatever but you know and i i worked with that my daughter helped me with that my youngest daughter and she said you know dad what's this book all about and i said it's kind of like everything i know thrown into the book so you know well, that's great it's, it's more it's probably more fun than writing a textbook isn't it oh yeah oh definitely <laughs> <laughs> well when i stumbled on you speaking of of major works is this art of followership is uh this this whole concept of followership, and we'll we'll talk about that. But my introduction to you was back in 2018. You may not even recall this, but I had I can't say I read the book cover to cover, but you were editor of that book. And I sent you an email on Valentine's Day of 2018. We must have been both romanceless. I, I have no idea we're we're corresponding on February 14th, but um I asked you to give me um uh, the most pressing challenge for leaders today before i share that response with you i'd ask you that question today nearly uh six plus years later what do you think the most pressing challenge for leaders today is 
Yeah. Well, I think the, I think the most pressing challenge for us as followers of leaders is to make sure that we're following the good leaders, the right leaders. Mm-hmm. And so I would say for the followers, that's the um, the biggest challenge. And I think for for leaders generally, it's you know how can we be better? I mean, how can if we're in a leadership position, how can we get the best out of the people that we lead, the groups that we lead, the organizations that we lead? And, you know, that's the challenge and do it in a way that actually benefits and enhances the process rather than, you know, doing it on the backs of our followers. You know, you want to leave people better off after you've worked with them, you know, in a leadership role. That's great because, you know, in my studies on, on leadership, um, you know, there's there's a debate about whether it's a, a theory, it's a it's a practice, it's a process. And um, it is a journey, right? And so sometimes you'll be stuck. I've been in corporate positions many times where I'm I'm stuck in a position and I don't have an exit strategy other than hitting the unemployment line because I am dealing with that leader as a follower. I'm a leader, but I'm also a follower. And so how do you how do you deal that, with that? And we'll we'll talk about if we have time toxic leadership. But how do you deal with that as a, as a follower if you're because you don't get to choose your your leader oftentimes, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's difficult because, you know, I mean, leadership in many ways is about power. And so, you know, whenever you're in a, a subordinate role, in a follower role, you know, your, your leader you typically has more power than you. But I think one of the things followers have to realize they have power, too. Mm. It's, it's difficult, though. Um, and, you know, and my... My collaborator, actually, on the book that you mentioned, my co-editor um, and my my good friend and colleague, Ira Chaloff, um, wrote a book called The Courageous Follower. Mm-hmm. And, and it's the subtitle that really tells what the book is about. And it's standing up for and standing up to our leaders. And what he's basically saying is if the leader's on the right track and you're moving forward, and you're doing the right thing, then you want to be all in. You want to be a good follower and, and committed. But if your leader's going off the rails or your leader is abusing you or someone else in the in the team, then you have to stand up to that leader. And that, that's where you need to have that courage. And, you know, unfortunately, of course, if you stand up to the leader, you can suffer for that. Um, you know, the other options you have if you're in a bad situation and you're working under a, a leader who is negative in whatever way, you know, you have the choice to leave. Um, you know, that's not often a good choice and whatever you're going to do is takes courage, but I could also argue that leaders need courage. Leaders need the courage to do the right thing, to stay on the path, the, the courage to, uh, do some self-analysis and realize how can they get better and what are they doing that maybe is hurting people. That's, that's a great, great word. Here, here's how you answered me on Valentine's day. You said the the fact that leaders need to realize that real leadership is a co-construction of leaders and followers working together. Successful leaders need to be follower focused, not self focused, and not, of course, self absorbed. And so I've I've been um, my leadership course that I just created is focused on servant leadership, and we won't talk about that today. But there's elements of that being follower focused what is what does that mean in fact what is what is followership because i i pose that to even a lot of people who've written books on leadership and they don't have an answer to that what is followership yeah i mean so so this all goes back to the fact that you know and you kind of just said it there when you in in that quote from 2018 is we know that leaders don't do leadership you know they it's leaders and followers together doing that creek construct leadership right leaders can't do it alone followers can't really do it alone unless they unless they lead you know i mean you can't have you can't have leaderless groups but that's a that's a a rarity in in many cases um and it's got to be in some context you know so you we don't do this in a vacuum and so the whole idea of followers and followership was something that just was neglected by leadership scholars and um, the way I got into it was I recognized this and there was a, a kind of a, you know, 
groundbreaking uh, concept by Jim Mindel, who was a leadership scholar in the 90s, and he coined the term romance of leadership. And basically what he said is that we seem to put our leaders up on a pedestal, all eyes are on the leader, we make them sometimes greater than, you know, than they actually are. And in that process, with all eyes on the leader, we neglect the fact that the followers are doing most of the work, right? That, and so I remember being at a, um, at a conference of leadership scholars, and I was on a panel, and uh, Mary Yulbeen, who's, who's been very um, instrumental in the study of followership, and, and she made a comment, and I made a comment, and I said, you know, we need to put our money where our mouth is and really focus on followers. We're leaving them out of the equation. And she agreed with me. And that eventually led to the conference that we had that, um, that from which the book, you know, that you mentioned the art of followership came, came out of that. It was essentially the conference proceedings and, and some work that people did after the conference. Yeah. I think you did. Um, one of the journal articles I read was followership theory, a review and research agenda. I think you collaborated with her on, on that. So there is some research on followership. Oh yeah, the, yeah it's growing, and um, it's still not, you know, not, nowhere near uh, the amount of, of research on leadership and on leaders. But um, but it's growing, and there's now a, there's a, now a global followership conference that, uh, in fact, it's uh, I think it's the end of April in uh, Scotland. And I went to it last year. It was in uh, in Virginia, and um, you know, so there's a whole group of of scholars that are just focusing really on followership. Yeah, the now now the cynic um, would probably hear us talking and go, "Well, isn't that a dressed up word for for subordinate or employee?" And um, you, because you talk about the leadership styles and you have shared leadership and and participative leadership and isn't this isn't this maybe a step up from you know stand in a straight line and and put on your mask and and it's just maybe more of warm fuzzy terminology well i think that's the stereotype i mean the stereotype is that leaders lead and followers sort of blindly follow you know that that kind of thing and and we know that's not really how it works that leadership comes from the you know from within the team and, and I think you mentioned it earlier, you ha had said to me that, you, you know, you had been in leadership positions, but you always have a supervisor. There's always somebody over you. So even leaders have to follow at, at some point, even if you're the CEO, if you're, you know, in a publicly traded uh, corporation, you're, you're following the board, you know, you're following the guidance of the board, if your board's doing their job. Um, and you could even say that leaders are are following the purpose i mean what what are you you doing you know you're you're striving towards something and so leaders are are following too and what we don't understand is much about the following process we understand the leadership process we talk about leader competencies and leader you know uh leader types and and things like that uh, much less talk on the followers, although there are follower typologies too. Yeah, and you talk about purpose as as a leader, you kind of know your purpose and and your objectives and your metrics and your key performance indicators and your quarterly financials or your objectives for research and and education and what you need to achieve. But I think it's a good reminder that we as leaders have to be cognizant and and even purposeful about what our followers' needs are. I think James McGregor Burns talked about that reciprocity um, in, in understanding that. And that that takes time because as a leader, you're charging towards those goals and, and what you know you need to march towards. But I think Kelly said, um, and, and I know he didn't have any research to, to back this up, but he said, followers directly contribute to approximately 80% of organizational success, whereas leaders may contribute to only 20%. Now, there may not be research to back that up, but as a leader, you're only as successful as your followers, right? Yeah. I mean, you can't get it done without without the followers. And your your job as a leader is to make that process work. 
And, you know, you do that in many ways. I mean, there's no doubt leaders have complex jobs. I mean, you've got to, you've got to pick the team members, you've got to develop the team members, you've got to keep them motivated, you know, you have to do all that, but, but it doesn't occur in a vacuum. It's not a one way kind of thing. It's a more reciprocal yeah. process. And, yeah. and so that's really what we're talking about. And so I think about, you know, leaders and followers together engaged in this and they've got to, they've got to click. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's sort of interesting the way we think about things is we think the follower or the leader does something, you know, gives an order and then the followers follow and, and then things happen. Right. Um, but it, you know, it doesn't work that way. I mean, it really works collectively, you know, the leaders and followers together creating, you know, kind of a synergy to make things happen. Yeah, and then if you look at the kind of the whys or, or hows, I think it was Senj in his book on learning, <clears throat> he talks about having the power of a shared vision, right? Well, if you don't have that shared vision and you just, you know, in, in a vacuum or in isolation, create that as a leader without followers involvement, you're not going to have the buy-in and, and you may not have the, the success. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, uh, article in 2014 in Leadership Quarterly said, while theory and research on leaders and leadership abound, followers and followership theory have been given short shrift. It's accepted wisdom that there's no leadership without followers, yet followers are very often left out of the leadership research equation. Fortunately, this problem is being addressed in recent research. And so I, I really appreciate, I had never heard of it. I took a, an elective class in my PhD program on followership and I thought, Hmm, never, never heard of it. And so, um, you know, I, I did, uh, I'll, I'll share with you one thing here sure. and, and get your, get your thoughts on it because I, I, I wanted to validate whether or whether or not there, the research has been trending towards um followership and so this this was back a few years ago and so this is this is not your type of research this is google scholar <laughs> and no, looking... no, no. I, this is this is really nice i mean yeah. i think i i see that you've got the leader centric versus follower centric and i think i think you know this makes sense that we are starting to include the the followers in into the picture and and you sort of see that as the timeline moves forward yeah and, and and if if you if you look at even since 2020 so it's only been three and a half years servant leadership is up 70 percent when you look at you know there's a couple ways i broke this up via article and then a general article and then a reviewable article and so Servant leadership was up 70%, transformational leadership up 40%, strategic leadership up 100%, and followership, eh, relatively flat. And so, but if you look at that in the last decade or two, and I attribute this a lot to you and um, and your role and, and the others that you mentioned by, you know, authoring and, and editing books and, and actually conducting research on this that there there is a positive trend and i can't imagine just you know you you edited that book art of followership and the beauty of that book is there's what 15 or 20 different contributors all coming at it from kind of a different angle right yeah yeah i mean we went went out and recruited the people who were who had studied followership in fact we had to kind of convince robert kelly to come to the conference because when he started it out, he was one of the early guys talking about followership and people said, what are you talking? You know, that that sort of negative connotation associated with followers. And he said he got so much flack for it that it was painful for him. And, he, <laughs> and so he kind of dropped it for a while and he focused wow. more on like high potentials. He called them, I think, star performers. And, you know, I mean, that's part of the thing. We have this, you know, this term follower that that has you know sort of negative connotations you know the the sheep kind of idea right the the blind follower mm -hmm. and and the big thing actually at that conference um the first day it was multiple days but the first day of that conference even the scholars were saying you know what i don't like the term follower let's get rid mm -hmm. of that and we tried all these alternatives and, and finally i just said look you know <laughs> 
let's stop arguing about that and just move the conference forward and just use the term and see what happens. And I kind of, you know, thought of that, uh, if they build it, uh, you, you know, uh, they, if, come. You know yeah. they will come. And I said, let's just, and now it's a kind of a legitimate term, at least in, for, among the scholars, the scholars pretty much accepted it. There've been attempts to, you know, call it something else constituent or whatever. But I think, I think we are kind of accepting now more of the term follower and those of us who are studying followers and followership, our job now is to persuade people that it, it isn't that negative. It isn't, right. it isn't unidimensional. It's not the blind sheep following, you know, kind right. of thing. Yeah. Cause Kelly, Kelly talked about five styles in, in that book uh, and, and the terminology of rethinking followership, you know, whether it's a, a cast member, I think Disney calls them and, and everybody kind of comes up with their creative words, but there are the sheep, which are the the passive uh, folks. Um, then you have the alienated, um, the pragmatic, the star, as you mentioned, th those that you, you want on your team, right? Yeah. They think for themselves. They're <clears throat> energy positive. They're independent thinkers. They're, they're really leaders in disguise that you want to develop. And so it's, I, I just appreciate you bringing this concept forth and I hope it continues to, to have momentum. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there is momentum and I think there's real interest. And I think most leadership scholars realize they're, they're, you know, they're often overly leader centric and they need to, they need to, you know, and anymore, I think we see it as this equation. It's, it's, you got to give attention to leaders. You got to give attention to followers and you got to give attention to the context because context really matters. And if we don't think, context matters, then, you know, we just went through the pandemic and it changed the dynamics of both leadership and followership. If you think about it that way. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, let's go back. If you were going to predict uh, a pandemic is going to happen, people aren't going to be able to come to the workplace anymore and they're going to be working from home individually, remotely. Uh, and you ask anybody to predict would productivity uh, decline, stay the same, or increase. And I think most people would say, under those circumstances, productivity would decrease. Remote work is, you know, people are going to goof off and all that. And we know that that didn't happen, that actually productivity increased during, when people went remote, which was kind of stunning. And part of that was because the, the good followers <laughs> knew how to follow. They knew how, they didn't need the leader to be there and you know face to face on a daily basis and the really good leaders who went remote were the ones who checked in with their followers and compensated for the fact that they they couldn't look them in the eye and talk to them and and so we know that you know that what we learned from that was that leaders really need to communicate and uh now the communication platform changed from face to face to online and uh, and, you know, some were successful and some were not so successful. Well, yeah. And, and you look at there, there is there are generational gap issues there. And you look at the typical uh, boomer or even I'm a Gen Xer and the, the mentality is, well, you have to have the, as they say, butt in the chair. Right. You have to be in the office to be productive. And so now it becomes a recruiting issue with, you know, if, if I can't work remote or at least have a some sort of a, a flex schedule, then it's it's not going to relate. But if you look at the Gen Gen Zers and Millennials, a lot of times 75% of Gen Zers say that they're a job hopper and, and they're okay with that. But if you drill down as to the why, it's because they're not being challenged. Well, that's a leadership responsibility is to understand their needs, their areas of expertise, and being willing to understand where they're at and what they need uh, in looking at their career. Obviously, there's the salary and the financial things, but, but you know, we as leaders need to take the time to understand those things. Yeah. And, you know, and that's why leadership, you know, is hard work because you've got to reach out to your followers. You can't, you can't, you know, go behind closed doors and, you know, and isolate yourself and be a really good leader. You've got to engage people. Yeah. Uh, just a, a segue here. Speaking of of those leadership styles, and there's there's twenty plus, and and I just finished this course online to do an exhaustive look at at each of those. But 
You spent some time looking at transformational leadership with Bernard uh, Bass, who would probably be along with uh, James McGregor Burns as the the experts in that that topic. And you wrote a a textbook on that. Is that is it congruent with with followership? What how would you define transformational uh, leadership? Yeah, from your perspective. Yeah, well, let me let me let me. Um define that and you know i had the great fortune i actually worked with with james mcgregor burns and with bernie bass and and i was often the messenger between the two of them because i was working with them on different projects and and um but but transformational leadership which jim burns originally called transforming leadership and and jim really did put the follower into the picture i mean he he did say leaders and followers together transforming, you know, it doesn't happen just by, by the actions of the leader. Um, and then Bass took that, I, those ideas and developed the theory and developed the measurement instrument and all of that. But I think transformational leadership is still leader centric because it deals, does still focus on the, the leader, but the transformational leader is successful by engaging followers and so I, I talk about sort of two types of transformation and transformational leadership. The first is transforming. And, and when Bass wrote his first book about this, he called it leadership and performance beyond expectations. Mm -hmm. And his idea was transformational leaders, you know, excel. They, they, they go beyond what the set goals might be, right? Beyond your expectations. So they accomplish things. So that's the first thing. But the second transformation that occurs is because the transformational leader accomplishes the goals through empowering the followers mm -hmm. the followers learn to develop and they become uh they they develop their own leadership capacity and if we think about that shared leadership capacity then what's happening is after the leader moves on or 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 retires or whatever, if you're talking about it in an organization, the followers are ready to step up because they, because that transformational leader has focused on developing them, challenging them. Um, so the, the, the uh, components of transformational leadership and transformational leadership sort of subsumes charismatic leadership. So there is that inspirational motivation, that ability to energize people. That's one of the elements the other element, though, that's really important um, is that leader sort of being out front. You know, you think about the the leader. This isn't the leader that sits behind and tells the troops to go get it. The leader rolls up his or her sleeves and gets in there and works with the followers. And so there's that, you know, uh, looking like a leader, you know, that. so that's an, another element. The third one is the dyadic relationships that the leader develops with each member of the team, each member of the people that the direct reports. And the idea is you're not gonna be able to motivate them, to inspire them, to get them to achieve great results if you don't know what makes them tick. Mm -hmm. You have to know what their needs are. You have to know, you know where, where they wanna be headed and you have to know their strengths and limitations. And so in developing that, and so I, I I often look at transformational leadership and leader member exchange as both kind of relational uh, leadership theories because they both involve that idea of, of getting the best out of the, the follower. Um, and so that's there. But then the last thing is challenging, challenging the follow followers. So if you think about what does a leader do that develops a follower's leadership capacity, well, they empower them. They give them responsibility, increasing levels of responsibility. And they challenge them. Yes, I know you can do this, you know, and I, I want you to stretch. I want you to do a little bit more. And so there is that element to transformational leadership. So so there's sort of these four components that are talked about, and, and I've kind of just jumbled them all together mm -hmm. there a little bit. But But that's it. And it's really, you know, transformational leaders get things done. They do the right things and they do it through empowering the followers, getting them on board, getting everybody aligned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's you know, they're looking for especially Gen Z and millennials, too, are 
what's in it for me. And so if I'm not being challenged, um, and, and some aren't in it for that. Some just want a, a strict variation. They want to go do something for a year or two, and then they want to move on. But some are, are really looking for what is my career progression? And so it, it really, and in, in my uh, line of work in the, in the corporate world, in the supply chain world, retention is a big deal. And so you can look at followership as strictly and transformational leadership as well as just recognizing and rewarding. Yes, that's that's important, but it's also to look at career progression and having you know honest dialogue on a regular basis, not just once a year uh, during a performance review, but having regular discussions. Um, and, and, and there's you know transformational leadership. I love it, and and who wouldn't like it? You know, if you had to pick one leadership trade out and say, which is the most effective? I'll let you answer the question, but it sure sounds like the best one, right? We, we want to transform our company, our organization. We want to achieve our results, uh, our financials, but it really is a, a recipe that includes charismatic leadership, um, inspirational leadership, authentic leadership and and Burns even talked about servant leadership some as well where you are looking at what the follower needs as you suggest and and that whole concept of a symbiotic relationship yeah, yeah. and yeah, I mean Burns studied uh, studied political leaders primarily and we and and this is one of the things I think why people are so upset with most of our politicians is, They've forgotten, you know, that they're, you know, they often use the term servants of the people, right? right. They're, they're supposed to be serving the people. It, it's a classic servant leadership kind of paradigm, yet they're not, right? They're, they have special interest groups. They're, they're serving the party's purposes and, they, you know, and the platform and, and their own selfish needs and, and uh, desires. And so that's where it sort of went off the rails. And if you, go back and think about what a you know what a true political leader should be should be representing the you know the desires where where does the where do, does the collective want to go what right. kind of, you know and we should be benefiting them and not benefiting yeah. them. I just finished up I'm doing some examples of the different leadership styles with political leaders and I use uh, Abraham Lincoln George Washington and and Martin Luther King Jr. And all of them looked at themselves as subject to the people. Yeah. In fact, they have quotes that say that, but in reality, they they lived it out. And so that is a, a big uh, disparity for sure, um, politics today. If um, Is there one most important trait or behavior um, with a leader that the research shows that that is most effective because it is transformational leadership and even followership are, are broad oceans, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, you know, leaders, there's a lot of competencies you need to have to be a le leader. You know, you need to, you need to be critical, be a critical evaluator. You need to understand things you need, but, you know, I think if you think about what a leader does is, the way the leader operates is through communication. And so when people say, what's the one, you know, what's the one skill I could work on to be a better leader? And I would say communication mm -hmm. broadly defined. Yes. What that means is, you know, can you truly connect with people? Now we're getting into like emotional communication and we might, you know, go down that emotional intelligence path or whatever. So there's the emotional part. There's also all the sort of cognitive parts of it. You know, you have to be smart. You have to make good decisions. You have to synthesize information and, and, uh, and, and, you know, process the information. And then there's the social side of it too, right? So you need to be able to know what makes people tick and you need mm -hmm. to, you know, know how to influence people. But all that I think could, could be sort of bundled up into the, the sort of broad category of improving your, communication skills in all of those domains. Yeah, I, I would agree. I, you know, leadership, there's so many definitions uh, out there, but if, if I had to boil it down to, it would be, you know, influence and communication. Yeah. And uh, what was, I think Kuzis and Postner talked about enabling the heart 
uh, yeah. no, enabling the follower and then encouraging the heart. Encouraging the heart. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. that is, that is a big part of it. Yeah. And if you if you lay transformational leadership theory and the leadership challenge, they they almost completely overlap. They're very, right. very, very similar. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to get to your your uh, your book here, too, as well. But be, before we do that, um, you you I was watching some of your other uh, podcasts and, you know, there's there's always this the obvious answer to the question of our leaders born or are they made? And so I didn't realize actually that you said there has been some research. Yeah, done. there has been. Yeah, um, I mean, it goes, yeah, it's the say it's the classic psychological nature nurture thing. They go to they go study twins. You know, they study identical twins because that's you know that's how you get to the the uh, nature part. You know, they share one hundred percent of their genetic material, identical twins. And anyway, and through that they can estimate. And it is, I mean, the estimate is about one third born and about two thirds made. And if you think about leadership, it's complex, you know, array of skills. So those pretty much have to be learned, you know, so it can be developed. And, you know, if we talk about followership too, I mean, no one's done this research, but maybe it's got a born component and a, and a made component. You have to learn to be a good follower. You know, you can think of people who have a temperament where they just don't get along with anybody mm -hmm. and they're probably not going to have the potential to be a really good follower. I mean, that's yeah. kind of interesting that I just thought of that because that would be a really good research question. Yeah, that, that would be good. So <laughs> that's your homework, not mine. <laughs> um so I, I want to, before we segue into your, your book, because I think this will answer some of these questions for people, but what does make an exemplary leader? We've, we've touched on it uh, to, to some extent, but if you're a follower looking at what makes a leader effective, what, what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I think we could go back to any of the the theories of exemplary leadership that we've talked about. So we could we could do it from a transformational or from a servant leadership perspective. But it's really focusing. You got to focus on the followers because they're the they're the labor. They're the 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 uh, the folks that are going to get the job done together with you. And so you really have to focus on them and and pull out the potential in those individuals. And so that that's critically important. But I think just important and where I've really kind of taken my research to is in the idea of, you know, what does it really mean to be a good leader? And so, you know, and I, I start off with the idea that there's a difference between being effect, just effective and being good. And mm -hmm. a, a truly good leader is effective, but they also do the right thing. And that's the critical element. And the right thing meaning you you know, you you leave pe you leave people better off uh, after you've worked with them than you found them. So mm -hmm. they've got increased leadership capacity. You haven't uh, you haven't caused collateral damage. I call it. You haven't mm -hmm. you haven't stressed the, your your followers out. You know you've you've challenged them rather than stressing them. Um, and you know and you haven't. The other collateral damage you haven't harmed anybody else in the process now i mean you know it's one thing to be competitive and beat people you know beat your competition that's okay but you don't destroy you know right. as you as you move forward you know so right. i think that that's that's it in a nutshell that's good yeah I, I jotted down a few things from from my readings and and uh kind of goes along those lines i think a follower will determine leadership effectiveness by the results are they competent uh are they leading the group to results are they communicating you touched on that are they getting timely feedback um do their actions align with the followers values and beliefs and that's a lot to do with with servant uh, leadership and values and you know credibility trust respect are they willing to sacrifice and care for their their followers and and do they connect with them so i think you've you've touched yeah, on that's a great list you've got a good list um, your your book though i mean your daily leadership development 365 steps all it takes is 365 steps 
Well, that's how many <laughs> days there are in a year. So <laughs> wait a second. How thick is is that two inches or yeah, it's pretty thick. So I so actually this was my COVID project. And I had kind of been thinking about it. And actually, the inspiration for it was, um, you know, I'm here in Claremont where Peter Drucker, when I came here, Peter Drucker would come and speak in my classes. And there's a book called The Daily Drucker, which is a reading a day from from Peter Drucker. And so I kind of had that idea in my head. But I thought, you know, what one of the things we work with undergraduates here and we develop their leadership, we do all kinds of things. And I was thinking about them and I thought, what happens when they graduate? You know, well, there's mm-hmm. some of them will go into leadership uh, positions and they'll get some leadership training through their company or whatever. But I thought, what can I give them as a parting gift mm-hmm. that will, you know, allow them to continue to work on their leader development? So that's really what I did. I, I, I made the book essentially for my students. I kept it as cheap as possible. I think the, the, uh, uh, ebook version is $9.99 or something. This hardcover is $24 if you go to Barnes and Noble. And, um, you know, which is pretty inexpensive for a book that's that thick, right? Um, and the idea is I'm sort of giving it away, you know, and and it's essentially you taking what we know from the research and what we know from work in leader development and it's sort of step by step. And, you know, it's my configuration. But I also you can you can take it as a year, but at the end of the the last, I don't know, 50 days or so are about things that people my age might be thinking about, too, in leadership is like, what's your legacy? Mm -hmm. Uh, When should you think about retiring and how should you go through the process psychologically of retiring Um, and and leaving the next generation? Mm -hmm. Right. You know. So the succession, there's things on succession, um, you know, so it, 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 you could read it, look at it as a year. You could look at it as your yeah. whole leadership lifespan. You know, Well, that's my, my research for my dissertation was on Eric Erickson's concept of generativity. And, and what you've done here is a very thick generative expression. Yeah. And so that's, that's a great, a great legacy. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper than a textbook. It sounds yeah, like yeah. So that, that was the idea. I didn't want it to be a barrier for people to to get. Well, my, my favorite was and I didn't get to get through the whole thing because I need an autograph copy here. But my favorite was day 11 um, leadership yeah. development, five ways to develop your leadership skills, yeah. active listening. Yeah. The active positive, learning. Right. Active yeah. Learning. Positive role model. Because uh-huh. we're always we're always a mentor and a role model, whether we think we are or not. People are yeah. watching. Yeah. Um, being flexible, mm-hmm. using a mentor or a coach, and, and that was it more towards um, you know maybe higher mid to higher level leaders. But you don't need to have a formal coach. You can have a. I had a reverse mentor who was a, um, a Gen Zer to help me. Uh, yeah. to learn so you can find somebody that shores up the skills you need and then number five was take on challenges so listening role model flexibility mentor coach and taking on challenges that's just one day of your of yeah. your leadership book so it's a great great resource yeah yeah well I, I i tried to tried to make it accessible tried to make it usable something that you don't have to invest a lot of time but if you if you did it every day or if you you know did it consistently, I think people would see some improvement over time. Well, and the and beautiful it's, thing it's about it is there's so many self-help books. Yours is it's it's not just theoretical and based on research, but it's practical. Yeah. Yeah. That was the idea. I mean, the what I'm suggesting in there is based in research. That's the but how can you take that research and and make it into something that you can actually use and apply? Great. If so, so we just talked about exemplary leaders. What what makes an exemplary follower? Because, like you said, we're we're both leaders and followers. So, if you're in the position or seat of a follower, how can you be a good follower? Yeah, well, I think I mean I think part of that is to to not be too just like a leader, not to be too self focused. You know, to th- think you. I mean, you got to have something in it. There's got to be something in it for you to be a follower, but it doesn't have to be all about you. And um, and I think, you know, building trust with the people that you're working with. I mean, so it's it's sort of some of the same principles. And we you know what I mean, I, I wish I could 
give you the four or five things like that, snap my fingers, that I can do that for leadership because there's so much research. Yeah. It's much harder for, for followership. Um, Ira Chaleff, and I've mentioned him, and I think his book, Courageous Follower, is great, but mm -hmm. he, he talks about different kinds of courage. The courage to stand up to your leader, that's a big courage because right. sometimes that, that'll get you in trouble. Um, but, you know, the courage to stick with it, to to um, to stay with the purpose and the mission, if you believe in it, um, you know, the courage to the courage to support your leader, which would maybe mean sometimes the leader is going to get the credit mm -hmm. and you're not going to get the credit. But that's the way the system works because of the romance of leadership. All eyes are on the leader. So, you know. And, the, you know, that takes courage to have to. So he, he talks about it in terms of different levels of courage. And that might yeah. be a way to, to do it. Yeah, I think I think the whole concept of servant followership, right, is how how can I how can I serve at least the, the, the most success I've had is just understanding my leader's needs and write them down, understand their leadership style. You know, are they a micromanager? Do they prefer to to not get together. Some don't communicate well. Well, as a follower, it's our job to force that communication. So I, I've i done that in some cases where I'll set up a, maybe not a weekly call with my leader, but a, a tag up session to make sure that I'm understanding what their needs are and that there's, there's not a misunderstanding. So yeah. understanding what their priorities are, being supportive, being a team player, you know, Leaders are always looking for change agents and and volunteers for assignments, you know, even though followers are always busy, you know, volunteering and saying, I'll do it um, when they ask for volunteers. I think a hard one that you mentioned is questioning, questioning, challenging the process, uh, challenging the status quo um, for me is is following through as a follower, following through on my actions. If mm -hmm. I said I'm going to do it or if I've been given an assignment, follow through on it. Yeah, yeah. No, that's great. And there, you know, there is literature out there on, you know, what is it, what does it mean to be a good team player? And I think really that's what we're talking about. So, yeah. But. Well, um, I think um, those were the the last things, One, the, the last topic here and just just your thoughts. We touched on it early on were what about following a toxic leader yeah. because you've got leaders that are destructive or dysfunctional or though there's there's harm maybe they're intentional or maybe it's it's unintentional but but what about that how do you, how do you deal with that practically yeah well i mean why we have to think of why do people follow you know bad leaders and and part of it is the power dynamics you know mm -hmm. we know that we you know, uh, Jean, uh, Jean Lipman Blumen was one of my colleagues. She's now retired, but she wrote a book on toxic leadership. And it actually, she was a co-editor on the, on the art of followership and, um, and her book on toxic leadership was really about toxic followership because she, that's the question. She said, why do people follow these leaders? Well, part of it is the power and you can bask in that, in that glow of power and, uh, you know, and power is very intoxicating to people. Um, but, you know, part of it, though, too, is we kind of value the wrong characteristics in our leaders. If we just look at all the things we just talked about that are good leaders um, that make up a good leader. But a lot of bad leaders are um, are strong men, strong individuals. They're mm -hmm. they're the ones that they, they're bullies, you know, they're they're And um, and. and and so they get their way by bullying. I mean, bullying can be very effective, but it's not a good strategy, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you know, you cause damage to other people. And so I think what happens is I think we have, we go back to our kind of evolutionary roots and we favor the alpha male. And I'm using that terminology yeah. because they, they talk about that in wolf packs and things like that. And so we, we value the strong individual and we think that that, you know, individual needs to be the, be tough and you know and it's part of our culture right i mean if you, yeah. if you think about it in our movies you know we have the the guy who tries to be you know the 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 hero and he tries to get along with everybody but the bad guys are bad and at the end he just kicks everybody's butt right 
and I think in our we have some of that in our pop culture and kind of in our heads and we think you know maybe the strong man's the guy to to go with you know like in a fight we want the the tough guy but you know what that's that's a rare circumstance and you know if you go with the tough guy then you're going to deal with the fact that that person's always going to be tough and yeah. not necessarily developing you and it's going to be more about themselves so um so you know i think the big thing is to be to challenge our leaders and challenge your own thinking about them and and stand up to them and make them prove themselves mm -hmm. to you you know well, and, and you mentioned because heroic leadership and and power is always going to be there and and there's a time and a place but and I've had great charismatic, inspirational leaders, and I've had great introverted leaders and uh, who don't come across that way. And so you look at Abraham Lincoln loved speaking and his speeches were just eloquent and cadenced and amazing. And Washington barely gave a, a, an oral speech. He, he learned to do it in, in writing. And so there may be different styles and approaches, but I think as a follower, um, understanding like you said why why are we following that leader it may be intimidation or power it could be the grand illusions and promise of promotion uh it could be a game-changing project they're working on or they've made you feel special or that you're chosen uh, or that there's just an exhilaration of of following that person or or they bring you meaning and purpose and none of those are are wrong it's just be careful and and do some you know emotional intelligence and self analysis to to understand why why are you following them and are some of those healthy things cloaked in bullying or or arm twisting or ethical dilemmas and those are good things as a follower to yeah. to consider yeah and i think that's it i mean you want to you want to you know it's about it's about the virtues you know it's about what you know what's this person's real purpose and am I aligned with that? Do I think that's a good thing? Or are they doing things that, that, you know, that, you know, you could do the mom test. Would my mother, you know, be proud of me for what I've done or be proud of me following this kind of leader? And, you know, I think that's a, that's a good way of thinking about it. Yep. Dr. Ron Reggio, the Renaissance man okay. of uh, leadership and followership. I encourage you to check out his blog. I'll put a post um in the uh in the notes here uh, check out his uh regioleadership.org the psychology today blog and then i really encourage you to to get a copy of this uh the book the daily leadership development 365 steps to becoming a better leader well thank you sir it was a pleasure and uh see if i can get out to scotland i don't know uh i got to get a job first so this this yeah. podcasting uh podcasting doesn't get me very far podcasting won't get you to scotland <laughs> well i enjoyed it very much doug it was great thank time. you sir okay take, take care bye-bye